ओके आई विल स्टार्ट very good morning to one and all present here it's a pleasure to welcome you all on behalf of ieee student branch ad patel institute of technology cbm university to today's webinar on git github and open source foundations i drushti panchori chairperson ieee adit student branch computer society chapter would like to introduce you to our instructor for today's webinar Mr. Madhav Bhai, on the behalf of our entire team, I welcome you, sir. Mr. Madhav Bhai is currently a software engineer at Microsoft and owns a YouTube channel titled The Lean Programmer. He is the founder of the Code to Express or C2E community, a tech blogger, a mentor with a vision to help the youth become better at programming. Without no further ado. I'd now request sir to address us. Over to you, sir. Thanks a lot for the beautiful introduction, Rishti. And let me start sharing my screen and let's start off with the session. It's going to be a super fun session. We are going to learn a lot of things today. So let me know once my screen is visible. Awesome. That's great. Cool. So today we are going to discuss a little bit about open source a little bit about git a little bit about github and all those things i hope you all are super excited for it because i am and we, it's going to be a super informative session and i'm going to give you a few things to explore at the end of the session as well so uh, if you want to access these slides you can go to madhavbahel.tech/ieeadit i repeat myself m a d h a v b a h l madhavbahel.tech/ieeadit and of course, before continuing with the session, I hope that you already have Git installed. In case you don't, you can go to this website, git-scm.com. It's simple, git-scm.com. From here, you can download uh, Git for your machine and then uh, install it. It's going to be a super easy installation. Cool, so today's agenda is going to include um, an introduction to open source, why the world of open source is blooming, um, removing some misconceptions about open source software and all those things. Then we're going to have a closer look at GitHub and show you a look, at, look into my GitHub account as well. And I'm going to tell you how can you get offers worth $200,000 just after this webinar. So yes, in case all of you are um, in enrolled in a university, you can get those $200,000 and that is going to be super exciting. Then I'm going to tell you a little bit about Git, a little bit about version control and all those things. And yes, I want this to be a completely interactive webinar. I don't want it to be me teaching you and you listening. So I have um, the chat section open right in front of me. So I want all of you to put in your views, keep putting in, keep chatting with me. So I want this to be a completely interactive webinar with, I want to talk to you guys and explain you the concepts of Git, GitHub, version control, and open source, instead of just giving you a lecture on it that you're going to uh, forget. So yes, it make sure that this is going to be an active learning process. So yes, a little bit of detour from our regular discussion on this topic. So there are two types of learning. Firstly, active learning. Second is the passive learning. Active learning means actively engaging in the learning process, following what is being taught, exploring it yourself after it is being taught and, and all those things. Whereas a passive learner just listens and forget. I don't want you to be of that in that place. I want all of you to be an active learner. So do not hesitate to let me know if you are facing any difficulty anywhere. And I'll try to resolve it at, at the best level I can. And if I'm not, then Google is always here with us. So yes, <laughs> cool. So. And then uh, not if time permits, I think time is not going to permit. This three section is also going to take a lot of time. So this is going to be your homework, your first open source contribution. I have written the steps in this presentation. I would, I would want you to go through those steps and then, and then um, 
do your first open source contribution yourself and please let me know how you felt about doing your first open source contribution you can feel free to uh, pin me on linkedin and tell me how was it you can uh, you can post on linkedin what all did you learn today from this webinar you can post on twitter and do tag me i would love to see it cool so after that we can have an open discussion where you can ask me any doubt that you have in your mind now i want you to guess what's common between all these logos mentioned here what's common between all these things that are mentioned here i want you to have a quick guess it's it's a very simple thing given that the topic that we are discussing today but still i want all of you to actually guess a little bit i i know that there's um around two minutes of lag between where i am speaking and what you are listening so yes i'm going to take a pause for just one minute so that you can get enough time to i'm sorry to type it out on the chat section what do you think is the common thing between them um i hope you must be aware of some of these logos at least at least this is python i hope that uh, you must have heard about it node.js php eclipse is an id uh, id um docker uh, Windu, then all these things android xamarin cordoba there are so many things so i want you to let me know what is what is the common thing between them hey harsh hey ayush good afternoon hey uh mahabhadra good afternoon cool i'm waiting for your response just type it out the first thing that comes to your mind whenever you see these logos mentioned open source exactly Raj gave the correct answer the answer is open source they all are open source softwares so what do we mean by open source i again it's going to be a completely interactive webinar i just don't want me to giving you a lecture i want you to completely actively interact in this workshop so i am going to ask you what do you mean by open source what's the first thing that comes to your mind whenever i say open source there are there could be a lot of answers for some it could be free software for some it could be um something that is available to us widely anything like anything that comes to your mind whenever i say the word open source by that time you can also uh, you can use this time that i am using to interact with you to actually download and install git from git-scm.com so yes, what do you mean by open source? I just want one line answer. I don't want any Google definition. So yeah, since it's an online, if it were a physical meetup, if, if, if it were an actual session, I wouldn't give you the time to actually go to Google and search for the definition. But yes, since it's, it's, a, since it's a virtual webinar, uh, then you might actually go to Google and then give me copy and paste the definition. I don't want that. I don't want a copy pasted definition from Google. I want what you think in one line is an open source software or what is open source so uh sg prajapati just said user friendly maybe yes that might be an answer but user friendly is actually a principle in software even when you are using a private software if you are using a closed source source software even if you are using um let's say a licensed software any any software or even if it's an open source software it might not be user friendly so yeah user friendly might not be the correct definition so mayur said that it's freely available that was a very good thing to actually uh, point out it's a common misconception that open source softwares are free we are going to have a look into it but being freely aware available might be true to some extent so yes uh, good guess on that Preet said that open source means code is available to public and anyone can contribute towards it. As simple as that. That's the basic definition. So I'm going to show you the definition, which actually Google says and every, everywhere it's written. Open source software is a type of computer software in which the source code is released under a license. So this thing released under a license is super important. Under a license in which the copywriter holds a uh, grant uh, user holder grants user to write uh, the rights to study change distribute the software to anyone and for any purpose so by reading this definition you might think where the copyright holder grants the users the rights to study change and distribute the software to anyone and for any purpose 
if anyone can see, if anyone can change the software, then why should we actually care about open source? Wouldn't it lead to piracy? There can be many misconceptions about it. For example, wouldn't it lead to piracy? Wouldn't someone else use your code out there? Wouldn't it lead to lack of money? Like we all think that from open source, we cannot learn uh, earn directly, directly, like indirectly. If you are producing a private software or, or a closed source software, you can sell that software to an organization and then make money out of it. But it's not the case in mostly not the case in open source software. Then why do we actually care about it? I'm going to tell you since uh, I really wanted to actually have an, a real time interaction with all of you guys, but it seems that the difference in time is actually more than 1.5 minutes. So it would be difficult for me to, uh, it would be boring if I wait and then you answer. So yes, uh, in the meantime, I'll also keep uh, reading the comments. So Neetu said that code is available to everyone. So code is available to everyone, but not freely. Here's where a lot of people actually get confused. I'm going to tell you one might not earn directly. So, so first of all, break, let's break this misconception that there is no money involved in open source. Yes, open source has money involved. Let me tell you, but before let's see why should we care about open source? So no matter if you are an individual or a startup or an organization or a small business or a nonprofit, it does not matter if you are an individual or a startup or an organization or a small business or a nonprofit. Open source is in your best interest. Why? Because firstly, people from all over the world can come and contribute to your software. The code quality will be best maintained if a lot of people will be seeing your code. They'll be they'll be checking like, yeah, this it's it's. It can be improved at this particular place. It can be improved if we add this unit test to this particular code block. If people from all over the world can see the code and can come and contribute to the code, then the code quality will be maintained a lot. It reduces the duplication of effort. For example, let's say, let's say open source softwares are not available and only private source uh, private softwares and the closed source applications are available. So for example, let's say I am building, let's say it is 19, maybe 1850 or maybe 1950 or any time when computers were, I don't know which year it was, but let's say it's the first software that I'm creating and let's say I'm creating a calculator. Now, if I create a calculator and let's say if I sell it to a particular organization to use it from in the, in their uh, another software and now let's say somewhere else from the in the globe wants to create another calculator he would have to create everything from scratch so open source actually reduces the duplication of efforts by increasing the the amount of um, code in the available as open source library so if i would have made this library which anyone could use then people would leverage on your code. It, it would help them a lot. And then finally, as a student, you can showcase your talent and competence via open source. A lot of companies while recruiting actually look at your online presence, your online, um, your, your open source contributions, your GitHub profile, your LinkedIn profile and so on. So yes, through open source, you can get a chance to showcase your talent. And of course, you can probably do programs like uh, GSOP. So GSOP, Google Summer of Code, you must have heard about that. It's not actually directly by Google. It's sponsored by Google, but never mind uh, that. So you can get into, you can get actually take part in all those competitions and all those programs. There are a lot of them. And then actually it will improve your profile. So yes. Um, and then of course you can lift the community. Always remember we rise by lifting others. So it's, it's, it's super important. The open source is in your best interest, no matter if you are either of them. But who told you that people don't earn from software, open source software? There's a lot of money involved. Let me tell you n number of ways that you can earn through your open source software. First of all, let's say you created an open source software and it got very like it got a lot of attention and it got it, it became very useful. Now, the first thing that you can do is probably enroll into GitHub sponsors program. So people from all over the world can come and sponsor you for your efforts. And trust me, some people are earning way much higher than what a company could give them by building open source softwares. Secondly, 
if your pro uh, project was good enough and if it attracted a lot of uh, if it attracted attracted a lot of attraction um attention i'm sorry if it attracted a lot of attention then various companies might be willing to sponsor you to actually show their brand name on your repository just for their advertisement and their prom promotion and trust me whenever it comes to promotion there's a huge money involved third thing could be you could release your software under a license so for example under the commercial usage license where probably you could keep it paid for commercial usages maybe you can keep your open source uh, project free for personal and individual and student and learning sources but you can maybe keep it paid for commercial usage and there's nothing wrong in it now every every um organization or every commercial product that's using your open source library or your open source project they will be paying you fourth thing as a student there are a lot of programs for example gsoc which pay a lot of stipend and again there's so there's a lot of money involved and uh, there are n number of ways to make money out of your open source project so don't ever say that one might not directly earn from open source so yes in simple words by open source i mean every each and every project that you can find on github of course which is not private is in simple words in layman terms is an open source project so therefore to make that an you know, contribution you just need to find a project that suits you and an issue to work upon so yes open source is the best thing that happened to the community and i'm happy to spread this feeling of love so yes uh, what are the prerequisites to start contributing to the world uh, the spelling mistake <laughs> there you are going to find a lot of spelling mistakes in this presentation uh, but don't mind that we are here for the for the knowledge not for the grammar <laughs> so cool uh, so yeah uh, any prerequisites to start contributing contributing to the world of open source no git and github are enough you can learn everything else on the go for example let's consider the example where um, you have completely no knowledge about open source and any let's say any library or framework or language let's say you are a complete beginner in tech but you know git and github you can probably start contributing into documentations while while contributing into documentations you can also learn a lot about those languages which that project is using and then start contributing in the project code itself so yes you don't need any prerequisite to start contributing to open source right now open source contribute uh, community is focusing a lot on git and github so yes i would say that git and github are the all, all the only prerequisites to start contributing to the world of open source so yes after this uh, webinar do listen to amazing ted talk by him cool so let me see the chat section if anyone asks anything new and let's uh, also pause for a minute here to consume to actually reiterate over the all the information that i told you and to consume that information properly till then i'll see the comments so neetu singh said that code is available to everyone perfect yes code is available to uh, everyone but under a license code is being shown to you does not mean you can use that code for any purpose you want so yes there could be bad repercussions for that so yes you must be aware of the license so for example let me give you an example let me open some random github repository let's say uh, let's say i just found out this repository in this uh, in the explore channel so here you can see this is a beautiful jekyll theme and it is released under mit license if if you are seeing this uh, ui for the first time don't worry this is github.com i'm going to tell you what is github.com and how it looks like and all those things so yes um, this here this license here is mit license you can read more about mit license there are a lot of licenses like uh, uh, cc mit um, and, and and so many and every license gives you a specific limit of how you can use this open source software cool so let's continue and yeah uh, developers collaborate on a particular project yes aditya said that open source its source code is public yes its source code is public but that does not mean that you can uh, you can just copy and paste it and release it under your name that would be wrong 
Cool. Aditya said that, okay, uh, Aditya is from our team only. Jeet said that how many, how open source software is different from freeware software. As I told you that free, uh, so Meet already answered this question. Freeware software may not have source code publicly available, whereas open source have. So cool. Thanks a lot for answering it. And then uh, let's have a closer, let's have a quick look at GitHub. So this is how our GitHub profile looks like. So first of all, you'll have to go to, so again, this UI, this was recorded, I think two or three years ago, because uh, that's when I wrote this particular um, uh, article. What I, I published an article, so you can definitely refer to this article, Git Good. You can go to this uh, Medium article, which is Git Good, Practical Introduction to Git and GitHub. And here you can find a lot of information, which actually I wrote. But this is the article, which I actually wrote, I think two or three years ago, and I took this Screenshot, screenshots here so that I don't have to record everything once again. The UI might be slightly different. Let me show you how different it might be. Let's open github.com. So get, now they have a pretty cool UI and it's, it's so awesome. So all you need to do is sign up for an account here. Let's make an account. Making an, an account will be super easy. Then this is how your account is going to look like. There is one more section that is added right now. A lot of people actually display their uh, their uh there um let's what do we call it a uh, sort of read me where you can actually tell more about yourself that makes your profile look super cool as well but never mind that so more uh in like in short your profile is going to look something like this there is going to be a repositories tab there is going to be a project tab there is going to be a star stack there's going to be uh, the number of followers, there's going to be number of following, there's going to be number of starred, and, and so on. So here you can create repositories. What is a repository? So SG Prajapati just asked me, can you throw some light, more light on various licenses and their limitations? So yeah, that we can do that. Probably let's let's do that as a part of QA. Otherwise, it might become a little bit long. Uh, so let's let's cover the content first, but still trust me, it's very, very simple to understand. All you need to do is, let me tell you, go to Google and then find open list of open source software and then uh, not software licenses. And from that list of licenses, you can probably find the most common ones, the general public license, the Apache license, uh, the MIT license, MIT is a very famous license, which a lot of people use. And from here, you can study what all. So even for me, like I don't have all that information on my fingertips that GP, GPL license gives you this limitation, the MIT license gives you this limitation. But yeah, overall, I think for MIT, it's like you can use uh, the software as it is that you as, as you want. Just You just need to attribute the creator of that, the author of that software. So yeah, uh, I think that was the case, but I'm not 100% sure about that, but you can always read about what all a software does and uh, what all, I mean, what all a license restricts you to do. Cool, so where were we? We are, so it has a contribution chart, it has the list of organizations and so on. So this was a simple thing. So the main thing to focus here is your repositories. Repository is a place where you can store your code no rocket science here no difficulties here repository is nothing but a place where you can store your source code let me share with you an example let's say i'll open my another uh, organization so for example let's say flash type so i recently created a flash type application so i'll show you so again if you are interested you can go to my youtube channel which is youtube.com slash the lean programmer where i actually uh, released um, a sort of playlist for react tutorial every month i create a new project so yes you can also a little bit of promotion i am so sorry the organizing team that i'm doing self-promotion here but yeah that's important too <laughs> cool so go to my youtube channel the lean programmer and check out these awesome tutorials but never mind that so yeah if you go towards that this is what a repository looks like uh, in your repository you can store the source code of the project that you are creating so yeah this is how a new repository look like i haven't pushed anything to this repository so these are some common terms that you are going to actually um actually hear a lot first of all a repository 
repository means nothing but a, a source of uh, a, a sort of place where you store all the code uh, pushing pushing to the repository means pushing your code from your local machine to your github repository pulling pulling as the name suggests pulling your code from the github repository to your local machine and so on committing and and all those things i'm going to tell you but yes this is how a github repository looks like and yes do have a look at this article for complete details again one more spelling mistake so as i told you i make a lot of spelling mistakes but don't worry about that it's it's completely understandable right i take a lot of webinars and weekends and i have to create content from the these webinars very quickly so don't mind the spelling mistakes cool so basics involve nothing but your personal information your organizations your repositories uh, stars repos following and followers creating a repository and creating a gist so this was a small introduction to github what github is so trust me uh mind you that github is something that people have started looking at as a sort of online profile just like linkedin so yeah many recruiters do have a look at your github repositories uh, github account while recruiting cool so now let's have a look at offers worth 200000 so this is something which i would want you to take a screenshot of and post on your instagram account so that your friends will be jealous of you that you will be getting 200000 rupees not rupees i'm so sorry dollars that means a lot in rupees in inr $200,000 is going to turn into i don't know how many inr so yes um so yeah i see a lot of questions as well but yeah I i'll come to that i'll come to that cool so offers worth two hundred thousand dollars so this is the github student developer pack i again remind you it is two hundred thousand dollars so the thing here is to promote their services and uh to promote their products a lot of companies collaborate with github to provide these services for free to students and these products and services are worth two hundred thousand dollars it's not a small amount you can see the proof here github develop student developer pack delivers two hundred thousand dollar worth of tools and training to every student so yes it's not a small amount so if you are a student if you are enrolled in a university right now don't forget to enroll in the github student developer pack you can go to this link here and then um so jeet asked a good question that is github the only platform for open source contribution no no there are a lot as meet said that there are uh, gitlab bitbucket and all those things and not just for open source the Basically, GitHub is a service that provides you uh, these uh, things on, on the cloud. So there are a lot of such services, for example, Azure DevOps, for example, GitLab, for example, GitHub, for example, um, Bitbucket, and there are endless of these services. But open source uh, community has seen a GitHub as a, like GitHub has got a lot of attention in these previous few years. So yes. So Neetu Singh just asked me, what's the idea behind the lean programmer? Ah, <laughs> cool. I'll, I'll probably answer that in Q&A since that's not completely directly related to, oh, by the way, I'm wearing the lean programmer t-shirt if that's not visible. But yeah, I, didn't, I don't think that's not, that would be visible right now. But anyways, I'm wearing the lean programmer t-shirt right now. I ordered that recently and I'm super happy that I have a custom t-shirt right now. But never mind that. Um, let's cut the small talks, guys. Let's, let's come back to the topic. <laughs> cool. So GitHub student, you can avail your GitHub student developer back from here. And let me tell you all the offers here. You, you get free 12 month subscription of Canvas Pro Tire, which is worth a lot of, well, it's, it's very expensive. And you are getting it for 12 months, free, completely for free. If someone is willing to share this with me, please let me know because I really want, I use Canva a lot because being a content creator and I want to use their premium tools, but I am not willing to pay so much to Canva. So yeah, if someone is, but anyways, never mind that. Cool. So DigitalOcean pays you uh, like $100 in platform credit for new users to actually explore their platform. GitHub Pro, you can actually use free GitHub Pro. Namecheap, you can get 
a dot com domain for free for one year dot tech domain name dot com and dot tech domain you can get one standard dot tech domain free for one year and that's super cool so yeah uh, these are endless list of companies that you can actually and products and services that you can actually get for free while you are a student so don't forget to actually avail your own github student developer pack it's worth offers are worth two hundred thousand dollars cool now i want to ask from you do you have an idea about what is a version control a simple question what is a version control have you ever heard of it can make it any guesses like any guess that you um, are willing to make that what is a version control awesome so sg prajapati said he knows what is a version control so yeah let me know what is a version control any guesses guys um so a lot of people are saying okay so pm said that no he does not know and sg prajapati said that yes he knows so make any random guess about what is a version control and then i'm going to tell you what exactly is a version control again i want this this webinar to be completely interactive i don't want just me speaking and you listening because it becomes boring that's what teachers and lecturers do all the time in our college and i used to hate that like i found it very very boring that just listening to a teacher for all the time cool so sg prajapati just said that um Okay, my camera is a little bit too high. Yeah, now it seems fine. <clears throat> cool. So whenever a company or developer wants to revert back to a previous version, they can revert back to a previous version. Exactly. Uh, as simple as that. Like uh, he told the whole concept behind version control in very simple words. So basically, while developing your software, you might make some mistakes. You might unintentionally add some bugs to your software and now what if you want to remove that so if you are not saving the state of your software continuously you won't be able to revert back you will have to do control plus z thousand times and that's not scalable that's not a scalable idea so yeah the thing is a version control basically sort of just like let me take an analogy of a game let's say you are playing a video game let's say you are playing assassin's creed or gta in your game while playing your game you must have seen that any time that you have to quit the game and go out of your room you probably save the state of your game and after you save the state of your game uh, whenever you come back you can actually resume your game from that point at itself so that's the idea behind a version control as well so the simple thing is at various stages of development of your product or your project or your open source project you can actually save the state of your code and then that will that will remain saved in the history let's say in future if you made any mistake and you want to revert back in time you can easily go back in time to that particular snapshot this might be a little little difficult to understand a little and a little boring but trust me uh, but uh, keep a little bit up with me so try to understand this that this is this is, this is very very important so feel free to ask me if you have any doubts here so version control because this is something that you are going to be using in your industry once you get a job i can guarantee 100% that they will be using a version control and most probably that version control is going to be a git so do try to understand it properly cool so version control basically uh, that's what the definition says version control systems are a category of software tools that help a software team manage changes to source code over time as i told you very simple example very simple definition version control system vcs are a category of software they are a software as well that help software team to manage their changes to their source code over time 
So yes, a version control system, VCS, keeps track of every modification in the code uh, in a special kind of sort of database. If a mistake is made, developers can turn back the clock and compare their earlier versions to revert back that can help them fix the mistake while minimizing the disruption to all team members. So let's imagine what if there was no version control. So yes, Bob will make some changes, Carol will make some changes, Ted will make some changes, Alice will make some changes, and all in all, it will be a recipe for disaster. So you don't want to do that. To learn more about version control here, like this was a short introduction which I gave you. This article on Bitbucket is a very good article, which contains a little bit more about benefits of using VCS and so on. Yeah, yeah. So SG Pradapati said that, can you please demonstrate how version control actually works? I can say that I'm familiar with Git, but I don't know how to implement version control in my project. Yes, we are going to go there. Don't worry about that. I'm going to tell you the basic um, sort of sort of algorithm behind Git and why it's better than other version controls. I hope that I added this. Uh, did I add this or not? Yeah, I think I added it. Yeah, that's there in the uh, presentation. Don't worry about that. Um, and yeah, I'm going to tell you a simple, uh, simple example as well. So a little homework for you is actually to get to know what Git and GitHub is and uh, sort of get familiar with the basic commands in Git. You can use these two links, Git good part A and Git good part B. And then you can also do this small crash course on Git command. <laughs> So what is Git? Let me explain you what. So coming back exactly to um, SG Prajapati's question, what is Git? Git in simple is the most widely used uh, version control system right now in the industry. So trust me, a lot of companies will be using Git today. And it's considered to be a best friend of any developer. So are Git and GitHub the same thing? I want to ask you this question. So I'm talking a lot about Git today and I'm talking a lot about GitHub today. So do you think that Git and GitHub are the same thing? Do you think that Git is equal to GitHub? Just want your views on that. Come on guys, anyone uh, who wants to add into this, like what's the difference between Git and GitHub and do you think whether Git and GitHub are the same thing and is there any difference between it? Yes, SG Pradapati is right that they are different, but I want the beginners here. If any beginner is watching this video, so this is a huge misconception which a lot of time people face that, that they think that Git and GitHub are the same thing. So all right. So I think most of you are already aware about this fact that Git and GitHub are not same thing. Git is the service. This is Git is the exact tool. So basically, so yeah, you are right here. I thought that people will be saying that Git is equal to GitHub. So no, just ignore this particular line. Cool. So yes, exactly. A simple thing which uh, S.G. Prajapati wrote that uh, Git works for local machine while GitHub works on the server or say online site. Yes, that's that's one wonderful thing to say. Basically, Git is the version control system. Git is the actual VCS that we use or basically a tool to manage your code history. Git is nothing but a tool that uh, the real version control while GitHub is a hosting service for Git repository. GitHub again, I'll repeat myself. GitHub is the hosting service for Git repositories. Clearly, they are not the same things. You can see it as Git is the tool, whereas GitHub is the service that uses that tool on the cloud, on the online website. So yeah, perfect. So you all got it right. I thought people will make this mistake, but yes, I am proud of you. 
Cool. So a little bit working on Git. So this is going to be a little boring section where people might get a little confused, but don't worry about this. This is just a sort of, uh, this might not concern you with your day to day work because you will be focusing more on the project itself rather than the working of Git. But yes, it's, it's essential to actually understand what is do Git doing behind the scenes. Cool. So Git thinks of its files more than more like a series of snapshots in a miniature file system. Basically, Git sees all the project as a series of snapshots, snapshots as just like the snapshots of code. So with Git, every time that you commit, commit basically means to save the state. As I was giving the example of your video game, in your video game, you can actually uh, play your video game then save the state and then go out and play and then go out and have lunch. And then after you return from the lunch, you are going to resume your video game from that particular state itself. For example, let's say I was doing a mission in uh, GTI city and then I will probably, let's say uh, my lunch got ready and I have to go and have lunch. I'll probably save the state of my game. I'll go out, have lunch and then come back and then resume from that particular uh, place itself. So just like that, every time you commit, commit is nothing but saving the state of your project. Every time you save the state of your project, Git basically takes a picture of what all files uh, look like that at that moment and stores a reference to that snapshot. To be efficient, if files have not changed, that's the best thing about it. If files have not changed, Git does not store the file again. It just links to a previous identical file that has already been stored. So yes, it looks something like this. For example, a version one was there with file A, file B and file C. Let's say in version two, A was made into A1, C was made into C1, but B remained just like that. So in the second snapshot, A will be A1, C will be C1, but the B will just be a link to the previous snapshot. In version three, let's say A remains A1, B remains B and C remains C2. Then only C2 will be changed and then A1, will have the same link to the previous snapshot. So these are the check-ins over time. Check-in just means the code that you check into your repository or basically the snapshot that you save. So now, as you can see here, for example, if I'm working on version four and let's say if I found that C2 has been introduced with some bugs, so I can easily revert back to my version three and start using version three. So here are some cool terms, snapshot, it records all your files at a given point of time that you can look them, look at them at some later time. As simple as that, like it's, it's no rocket science. It's very simple thing here. Like Git is the easiest thing that to understand, but still a lot of people feel a lot of issues uh, in understanding it. But let me explain to you in a very simple manner. A snapshot is nothing but a, a record of your files at that point of time. Commit. Commit is nothing but the act of creating that snapshot. Repository, it's just a local or digital storage where, as I was telling you, it's just a local or digital storage where your files were being stored. Head. Head is the reference to the most recent commit. For example, in this diagram, your head will be at version 5. Branches. All commits live at branch. Now, this is the most important topic here, a branch. So all of the files, Git follows a tree-based structure. So for example, imagine this as tree. So all your source code will be in, so let's say in first snapshot, it's here. In second snapshot, it's here. But now let's say if some other developer is also working. So now your other developer will have to work on a code base without affecting this code base itself. So what he or she will do, he will take another branch. So every code is present in some branch and every people, every person, every developer tries to work on his own branch and then merge that branch with one common branch that is going to contain the code that is deployable. I know it went very fast. Let me explain myself once again with a small example. So a simple example is that a branch is nothing but a container of your source code, but to make it easier to work in teams, Git does one thing that Git tries to actually, so there's one branch where every code will be stored. So see this line here. 
So this is the common branch. Generally, it's called master, but recently a lot of people have started using other names like main. So this is the master branch. In your master branch, there is the first snapshot. This is the second snapshot. This is the third snapshot. Now, for example, I am working on a new feature. So what I'll do is I'll create another branch for my existing master branch and start working on my feature. Why to do this? Very simple because we don't need to break master. For example, let's say if I'm working on a small feature and let's say what if that particular feature uh, went wrong? What if there were some bugs in that feature? So that so what we do is we don't change the master branch. We take another branch out of it. The process of creating another branch is called forking. F O R K fork forking fork is your fork the, that smooth spoon type of thing. So we fork out another branch from the master branch and then start doing our work on that particular branch. And then we test it out. We test out locally. We write unit test. We do all those things. And once it's tested completely, we merge that branch to the master branch and to make sure that the master branch is 100% deployable at every point of time. I hope you understood that. So I was having a look at the chat section. So Animesh just said that how to differentiate where a program is open source or licensed or not. So open source softwares are also licensed as Meath said, and let me give you a small example how to check them. So if it's a Git repository, a GitHub repository, in the GitHub repository specifically, you can, let's say if I go to a random uh, repository, let's say uh, this W3C, the, that's uh, slash Koga. I'm not sure what this is. I just open a random repository. So here will be a license. So from here, you can view the license of that open source. So it does not have any license. I think it has some W3 document license. Yeah, it has W3 document, W3, W3C document license. So from here, you can check the license and then read the license and read everything that is permitted to it or not. I hope that solves your issue. No. So SG Prajapati just asked me that is it necessary to push the code every time everyone makes a small commit? No, it's not at all necessary to push your code every time you commit. So let me explain to you what is push and what is commit. Commit just means commit is nothing but act of creating that snapshot. You are saving the state. Pushing means pushing your code to your GitHub repository. So now you people generally push whenever they uh, like whenever they want to create a pull request or whenever they want to actually store their code in the uh, GitHub repository. It is not at all required to push every time you commit. It's completely up to you. If let's say you made a significant change, you made the commit and let's say if you want to create a pull request, you'll probably, um, you'll probably create the, you'll probably push the code. So let me tell you the difference, the basic difference, why we commit and why we push. We commit so that we can revert back the changes. We push so that that code can be seen by other developers as well on the GitHub uh, repository. So now, if you think you have done enough changes that you can make others see your code, then yeah, feel free to push it to your GitHub account. And even if you don't have made those changes, you can still push it to your GitHub repository in some other branch. But commit, let's say if you are the only one working on that branch and you, you know that your local machine is not going anywhere. So you can just commit and then revert back to that commit if you want. So yeah. Cool. Um, that's that. Cool, cool, cool. So yes, a little bit of setup. So just read it out, read this particular uh, report. Uh, article here. I am going to take a little break of just one minute. I'm tired of speaking. It's been 50 minutes since I'm speaking continuously. So just give me a pause of one minute here.
Meanwhile, to the participants, they can post their questions in the chat box and it will be answered at the uh, end of this session. Over to you, sir. Yeah, thanks. Cool. So that was one um, enthusiastic uh, webinar. <laughs> cool. It's almost ending now. So let me tell you these five common commands that you might be using frequently. So refer to this article after this webinar to actually know how to set up GitHub. So first of all, we need to set some global config and uh, that's it. Firstly, you'll have to download Git, then do some config and like that. So let me tell you the five most frequent commands that you might be using. So first one is git init to initialize a new repository on your local machine. Second one is to add origin. So origin, let me tell you. So, so there is two things. Firstly, there is a branch. Secondly, there is a remote. Remote is nothing but the remote or the machine which actually contains the repository. It might be your local remote. It might be the remote of GitHub. It might be remote of uh, Azure DevOps. It might be the remote of GitLab. It might be the remote of Bitbucket. It might be remote of any other service. So yes, generally we name it as origin. So we actually name the um, remote as origin and add that remote. So where is that origin remote? So for that, we'll add the link to our GitHub repository. So what the second command does is git remote add origin is nothing but link our local repository to the GitHub repository. It creates a link between them. Then once we have done the changes, we will start adding the files to staging. So yeah, we add it by git or we can do git add this particular file name. If you want to add all, all the changes, then you can do so in future uh, whenever someone comes across your commit they can actually see that particular commit message and know what change was this so it's a very good practice to actually include a meaningful commit message in all your commits and then you can push it to your master master is the branch origin is the remote u is upstream so this flag dash u origin master is required only for the first time and after that it saves it so after that you can directly use git push let me give you a small example here let's go to my github account uh just a second here is it github.com slash mother well oh and uh of course if you haven't followed me till now on github this is your chance to do you can go to github.com slash mother well and follow me on github Cool. So let me create a test repository for all of you. Click on the plus icon, create a new repository and then name this repository. Let's say test repo for IEEE ADI. Cool. Now you can also provide some description. So let's say a uh, random test repo. You can choose to create it, make it public or private. So you guys have, you guys have come to the world of open source and on the source of uh, in the world of GitHub at a very good time. Trust me, when I was in college for first and second year, private repositories used to be paid. Like private, private was something that was a paid concept in GitHub. But after I think in recently before two or three years, they made private available to everyone. But even in our time when we were students, uh, we I was a part of GitHub Student Developer Pack, the pack which I was talking about, GitHub Student Developer Pack and it gave me the access to private repositories. So this is super cool. So yes, um, now GitHub provides private uh, repositories for free, but there are some limits to it, but anyways. So yeah, you can keep this public or you can keep it private. If you are keeping it private, of course, it's not an open source project. If you're keeping it public, it is an open source project. Let's create a repository. And now let's go to our local um, folder. Let me go to my playground. Cool. So I am here and from here, I'll create a new webinar, a new folder, IEEE ADIT. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to explain to you the usage of these five most common commands. So firstly, I created a GitHub repository here. Now I'm on my local machine. I probably start making some changes. Uh, let's add a simple code, JavaScript code here. New file, let's say um, test.js and let's just con make a function that logs. Uh, so let's say const I do the logging equal to something like this. 
So this is your software here and console dot log. Uh, let's take an input here and it logs out the output. Cool. So let's say this is my software now and let's say I need to save it. So I'll go to my terminal and then I'll probably do git. Oops, why is it here? Git init. Git init initializes an empty GitHub repository, Git repository, not GitHub, uh, Git repository to your uh, to your local folder. And then I'll add the remote. Again, there are two things, branch and remote. Branch is nothing but the branch where you are working on. Remote is the link to basically the uh, GitHub repository. Git remote add origin, the link to this particular repository. And now git add dot git commit dash m um, test message git push dash u origin space name of the branch master. And now that's it. That will be pushed to your GitHub repository. You can see the recording of this video to actually revisit the concepts. And now that's done. So yes, this was a simple usage of five commands. There are endless more commands. For example, you can clone this repository. So you don't need to initialize the repository everywhere. Initializing is done only for the first time. So now let's say if you have changed the machine or you want to work on an existing open source project, you will clone that project instead of uh, doing the git in it, git clone. So it will be something like git clone and then the link to the repository what's happening cool yeah that's it git clone and the link to the repository so that was one thing and then there could be creating a new branch creating a new branch is done using git um, branch so for, for, first of all grid branch will tell you the list of all branches present here till now there's only master so now let's say i need to make a new change in my function so i'll probably work on a separate branch so this will be done using checkout git checkout Creating a new branch would be dash b. Dash b stands for new branch. And then the name of the branch. I'll name it, let's say, uh, I'll name it, let's say, add, add test, something like that. And now let's do my changes. For example, uh, testing our function. And let's try to call it. <laughs> so let's try to, maybe I do the logging and let's name it as anything like 55 and yeah let's say this was my change and now let's add those changes again git add dot git commit dash m uh, some usage random and now i need to push it to my github repository which is git push dash u origin origin is the name of the uh, remote now branch this is not master this is add test branch let me remind you the name of the branch is not master here git branch we are working on add test branch so now i'll do this git push dash u origin add test as simple as that and now when you go to your github repository if you refresh the page you will see that add test has been added so there are two branches here master and add test and now you can create a pull request after creating a pull request you can add the details here and then submit the pull request. Now the maintainer of this repository will see your changes, the changes in the file, and he will probably tell you to review the changes and all those things. And then he can merge the pull request and then it will be a part of master. As simple as that. This was the brief summary of how we work in the world of open source. Now open source contribution in six easy steps. This is your homework for today. Don't forget to make an open source contribution. Firstly, find your open source uh, project. You can use websites like issuehub.com, code trials, up for grabs. First timers only would be a good one. Um, first timers only and, and all those things. And then do your open source project contribution and don't forget to share it with me. You can DM me on LinkedIn. You can just let me know. I will be very happy if I know that I actually helped you make your first open source uh, contribution. And I would be really glad if you can make a sort of LinkedIn post or a Twitter post and then tag me and I'll be able to see what changes, what contribution did you make.
So yes, a simple announcement before we go on to the Q&A, a very small announcement. I have been recently working on tutorial series for React. This is again, some self promotion. <laughs> so uh, yeah, uh, so I have recently released a small tutorial videos on the React. So you can go and check out my channel, which is youtube.com slash the lean programmer. Cool. So Meet just told me tip of the day, don't ignore, get ignored. So let me, now that we are talking about get ignored, let's, let's have a little bit talk about it. So for example, let's say you are using some library, some open source library, for example, I'll name it as library.js. So let's say this is some open source library, which you were using. So now let's say this had a function that, um, I function, I help with logging. And let's say it does um, anything like it does something, something like that. And now if I export this, so now let's say I'm using this function here. I help with logging, something like this. So this is just an example. Don't go into too much detail into it. But now this, I help with logging. This library is an open source library. It's not your library plus uh, it's already available on the internet. So you don't have to push the source code of the external libraries. So to ignore these particular files, we use this file called dot git ignore. Now in this dot git ignore, we can add the files, for example, library.js. And now once I save it, you will see that it will become a little bit unhighlighted. And now our version control will not track it. So very simple, the files uh, or the directories mentioned in git ignore will be will won't be tracked in your by your version control so don't forget to use git ignore to untrack the unnecessary files because you don't need to push the unnecessary files to your github account right that's completely illogical why would you push that because that's already available on the internet so why would you increase the noise in your repository so yeah that's it i am open to uh i'm open to the uh Q and A. Let's have a Q and A for fifteen minutes, and then probably we'll wrap up the session. It was indeed an honor to hear from you, sir. Our audience has been pouring in a lot of questions during the webinar, and they are very excited to hear from you. Uh, we really hope th that for the beginners, they make their first open source contribution after your uh, webinar. So, without further ado, let's jump to the Q and A part. Sure. Yeah. So the first question is, uh, can you have, can you share your journey of becoming an SDE at a tech giant like Microsoft? Um, okay. So that's a little bit off topic, but yeah, cool. I'll do that. So by journey, I'm not sure what are you referring to? So it's of course, as simple as giving the interviews and then getting the job. But again, so if talking about my journey, like the entering process is um, simple. Like you have to give the interviews and then you have to get in, but there's a lot of process behind it. You have to work a lot. You have to make yourself uh, capable of getting into the tech giants. So yeah, I'd say that for that, um, I had this habit of exploring and learning a lot, which I still do. So yes, that's the simple advice from my side that never stop learning, never stop exploring. Uh, keep in mind that competitive programming is super important. Keep in mind that problem solving is super important. Keep in mind that uh, you should be aware with the, you should be good with the basics. Keep in mind that data structures and algorithms are super important. Once you are done with that, start applying for these jobs. And then uh, there will be some online coding interviews. Then there will be the, first of all, there'll be coding round, then there'll be technical interviews, then there will be HR interviews and so on. Talking about my journey, like uh, in first and second years, I spent a lot of time in learning a new thing, learning new things. I learned web development, I learned backend development, I learned front end development, various uh, front libraries and frameworks like React and Angular. And yeah, I started studying uh, DSA and all as well. So yes, this is going to be your journey as well if you actually want to uh, get a good job. So that's there's no there's no shortcut to it. And then yeah, start applying. So yes, by journey, if you were saying the interview experience, we can also probably discuss it sometime else. But if you want the other things like what all did I do in my college, yeah, I can share that as well. But yeah, I'll keep it open to you. Thank you, sir. We really hope our viewers get inspired by your journey. 
So moving on, we have the next question. Uh, how to differentiate whether a program is open source or licensed? So open source programs are also licensed. So first of all, uh, the question was a bit wrong here that how to differentiate whether a program is open source or licensed. Open source programs are also licensed. So a good question would be how to differentiate whether a program is open source or closed source. So if you're able to see the source code, it is open source. If you're not able to see the source code, it's closed source. Uh, and let's say now how to differentiate whether it's free to use or whether it is licensed. Uh, then again, as I told you, like uh, just go to the GitHub repository of that particular uh, open source project. If you're able to find the license, most probably there's going to be a license. I even remember there was some life, li some license like I don't give a like this license. And now this license, the documentation of this license was that do anything with this project, I, I don't really care. And that was super cool. So you might actually find these uh, particular kind of licenses as well, where the user is granting you all the rights to freely use, uh, change and redistribute the software without their permission. That is one kind of license. There will be some open source licenses like MIT, where you will be actually be free to use the software as you wish just by adding like i think react is also under mit license you can use your react in any application that you want just um the only limitation is that you you should not just uh clone react and then um publish it under your name and then start selling it so that is the i think that's the only limitation with mit that you should not sell it under your name you can use it to build projects on top of it but you should not sell it under your name and yeah there are an endless license and as i told you it will be written here uh let's see if i can show you some example let's say daily js uh it will be written somewhere here if there is a license there will it will be written there yeah that's it yeah so moving on we have another question from my viewers github or gitlab your views please um, I might not be the perfect person to answer that because I have not uh, contributed a lot in GitLab. Since my college days, I have been actively using GitHub. So I am a huge fan of GitHub and I have not contributed a lot in GitLab. So yes, anytime, but like I am saying GitHub is better because I am partial towards, I'm biased towards GitHub because I have been using GitHub from years now. I've been using GitHub from more than four years now. So yeah, I'm completely biased towards GitHub, but GitLab might be providing you some things that GitHub doesn't. So yeah, so that's completely up to you, but don't get involved with too much things like GitHub or GitLab, just start coding and just start learning. Like it's, it's not, it's not which platform you're using. It's about your project. It's not about the platform that you are using. We hope the questions of our viewers are getting answered. Uh, also to mention, uh, we are providing the feedback link in the chat box below. The participants will receive certificate only if they fill the feedback form. Uh, moving on, we have the next question from our viewers. How does open source contributing actually works? Taking Linux, for example. How does open source community actually works? Taking React and Linux, for example. Cool. So this is a very, very good question. So there, as I told you, there will be endless examples. So let's take about the closed source projects and the uh, private project and the first party projects. How do they work? They have some cool allocated employees where one, there will be several developers, there will be product managers, there will be program managers, there will be managers, there will be designers. So it's a whole team of people working together under one umbrella to form a new product. That's how private organizations work. Everyone has their own jobs, which they have dedicated to, and they're getting paid for that particular job. That's how code, uh, that's how the private institutions work. But that is a very amazing uh, question that I don't know who asked it, but uh, that's a very, very good question that how does things work in open source? Because there's no one to pay you. There is no one, there's no defined roles that uh, there will be one PM, there will be one dev, there will be one data scientist, there will be one designer. So how do the things work? So as simple as that, I'm going to tell you with an example. For example, let's say if you get an idea of an open source project in your mind in future, so you will have to do a little bit of hard work here. 
So for example, let's say if I have to make a simple, mm, let me take an example, a typing speed test application. Let's take a very simple application that I am building a new cool or let's say a task, a project management or let's take a little bit better example, a to-do <laughs> to do, uh, to do project. I said that I'm going to take a better example, but I actually resorted to a worse example, but yeah, never mind that. Cool. So let's say if you are building a cool to-do application, which is much better than the existing to-do application, then you want to make it open source. So first of all, you will have to start working on it. Either you can actually approach people in your, so when you start contributing to open source, you will actually find a lot of like-minded people who will be willing to contribute to open source and who will be willing to put in a lot of hard work, even for free in initial days. So yeah, you will have to do that initial threshold thing to actually get your project up and running, you'll have to uh, push it out to GitHub and so on. That was the first way. So yeah, that was the first way you can just make a small prototype, push it to GitHub and then open some issues. For example, uh, let me, if I go here, um, uh, let's just, just a second. Uh, let's say for example, uh, startup name generator. So this was a very, very simple application. So there's some vulnerabilities, just ignore that. This is not a production application which anyone is using. So we can ignore this, but if it were a production application, oh, I see I'm sharing the screen, right? I am not sure. Can you confirm this, Rushdi? Yes, sir, it is visible. Awesome, awesome, awesome. So I just thought that I stopped sharing and I'm giving the reference to the screen. Cool. So yeah, you can ignore these vulnerabilities unless and until it's just a learning pro uh, project. But yeah, you can uh, I can remove that very easily by doing the Git audit. Uh, but anyways, never mind that. So what we are going to do here, once we have the small prototype of this particular uh, project up and running on our GitHub repository, we can start creating issues. We can start creating our project wiki and project board. In our project board, we can actually start adding the, let's say, uh, the test project. And here we can start acting a column. So this is a Kanban board, I think. Then you can include to-dos and all those things and, and, and all those things. And you can add issues. For example, I want to integrate the domain, domain name check. I want to uh, improve the UI. So now this will be open to public and a lot of people will be able to find them through these tags. As you can see, there are a lot of tags available here. Easy pick, enhancements, first timers only, good first issue, enhancements and so on. So now people can search for these tags and then find my GitHub uh, my open source project. And if they like this project, they can start contributing to this project. And on and all, it, it while gradually it's going, it's going to be a team. That was the first way you can go ahead with it. Now the second way could be to first find a team and then start working on it. To first find in your contacts, on LinkedIn, on GitHub, approaching the people that I have this idea, I want to make this an open source project. Would you be willing to contribute to it and then start along with him or her? So I hope this answers your question. Uh, yeah, moving on, we have another question from our viewers. Uh, uh, he's asking for the command for adding description in the particular commit message. I see. I don't exactly remember that, but yeah, I can easily check check it out. I just resort to adding the command, the message only. Let me search that. These things you can easily search on Google, right? Uh, Git com command for let's say adding description in com uh, commit. Let me see. How to commit a change with both message and description. Yeah. So Stack Overflow has everything. So dash M. Yeah. This this command. So I found it very easily. So you don't have to buy heart all the commands. You just have to be able to. So a software engineer is a good software engineer is the one who knows who does not know everything by heart, but the one who knows how to Google things properly and just like how I did it. Yeah, that's as simple as that. There's one more question. Why would someone collaborate for free? Yeah, this is a good question because a lot of people actually have spirit of open source uh, in their mind. Like everyone has have their own uh, thing. So there can be endless benefits in, in uh, let's say, for example, firstly, first type of, so there are multiple type of relationships here. So firstly, I will say between two different stakeholders. So this, I'm using some terms here, which might confuse you, but a stakeholder is nothing but a person who will be involved in the project. 
so between two stakeholders there can be multiple type of relationships so for example let's say i am the owner of the project and then you are some uh, someone who who probably looks upon me uh, looks onto me as a potential mentor or who wishes to learn from me so now this is the first kind of relationship so you will probably help me out with some project to actually learn about how i work so this was the first example why i started contributing to open source i wanted to learn how big projects are maintained i wanted to learn how do people uh, what's the correct directory structure what's the correct coding practice what's the correct styling practice and so on so why should you contribute for free as i told you in the starting as well it will increase your knowledge a lot firstly because when you will see others project uh, you are going to actually learn a lot about how people what are the good practices of software development so yeah that's the first thing you're going to learn a lot so that's why you can probably uh, contribute secondly it's not free probably if you are not at all willing to contribute for free you can probably aim for gsoc or programs like that now secondly uh, third thing is first thing was the learning standpoint second thing was the payment stipend standpoint where you can enroll in like take part in some uh, programs now third point is networking you will find a lot of great friends and communities if you start commute uh, contributing to open source you will learn and you will network a lot you will actually make a lot of new friends in that and the fourth thing is being open to new opportunities and building the brand and building the profile when you contribute to open source you will your profile will be you will be building your profile simultaneously everything that you do in open source community is public it will appear on your github profile and people will be able to see that so people don't people make resume for free they do they do make the resumes uh, resume for free because they want to showcase their skills don't people make invest their time in making a linkedin profile don't people invest their time in writing blogs why do they do that everything is for free because they want to build a personal brand and a personal profile a good profile that can that can separate and differentiate them from the crowd so that was a simple answer in four things that yes even if it's for free you probably might invest your time in it. thank you sir we really hope that all the questions from our viewers are answered now if you would permit we would like to have a quick rapid fire round uh, related uh, questions that are related to software development okay yeah so the first question programming language for the future javascript i'd say but there's no such thing as programming language for the future because every programming language has its own use case python is meant for something else scala is built for something else uh, javascript is built for something else although it's being used at every place say still it's being used at a lot of places but every language has its own use case so there's no such thing as programming language for future there is thing there are things like programming language for this domain you could ask programming language for machine learning you could ask programming programming language for computer programming you could ask programming language for uh, dsa but there's no such thing as programming language for future but if you are uh, still willing to know i'd say javascript because it's expanding a lot in every domain like computer programming you can do with it iot you can do with it web development you can do with it backend you can do with it everything that you want you can do with it but still it's not the best answer okay moving on ios or android android for me because i am an android user <laughs> ios for anyone who is an android ios user but i feel ios actually puts in a lot of restrictions because i i wanted to become an ios developer initially but i did not have a mac and i did not have an iphone and i found out that a person who is not having a mac and not having an iphone cannot develop ios applications which is which sucks which like why would you limit your developers to your your own platform so yeah uh, a lot of people might get offended here who love apple but still uh, i believe that being op like yeah I, I believe android is better because it it's it's open to everyone no matter what platform you're using if you're using ubuntu if you are using windows if you're using a mac you will be able to make android applications moving on best web development framework for novice web developers framework back end or front end uh back end also oh, back end i think uh, let's talk about the whole stack i would say mern stack is being very good uh, like it's very famous today mern stands for mongo express react and um uh and for node js yeah 
So yeah, you can probably for backend pick up Node plus Express for database MongoDB and for frontend um, React. It might not be the best answer depending on the global use case because along like trust me, the answer to every question is in life. It's a true thing. Every the answer to every question is it depends. So it depends on what you are building. It depends on what you are using. It depends on what your situation is, and it depends on how much time you have to learn. It depends on depends on endless things. But keeping into mind everything and like if I have to answer it generally, I would say MERN M E R N stack is is a little bit easy and uh, the learning curve is very smooth. You can get started with it within days and yeah. So I would go with MERN. Okay. Uh, so the next question: What's the best way for uh, a newbie to use GitHub? Um, just keep building side projects and start pushing your side projects. It might be you after two or three years, you might feel embarrassed on what you have pushed to GitHub, but that's how we learn. And then you can probably make those repositories private or maybe delete them. But unless and until you start using, you won't be able to figure out the concepts and learn things. So start building side projects, clone some existing websites, make a clone of WhatsApp, make a clone of uh, um, Facebook and start pushing it to your GitHub account. Uh, drawbacks of open source. Drawbacks of open source. I believe if um, I don't see any drawbacks as such, but I believe um, if if open source could be a little more, um, little more, if there could be an easy money in open source, it would have been a better motivation for a lot of people. Because yeah, in closed source in companies, people do provide stipends and salaries, but open source is open. But that's what it makes it open because. If it was salaried, then it would have been controlled by a particular organization and entity. But since it's not, so yeah, I don't feel there's any specific, but there might be on like, yeah, but it's just views. It's just about perception and viewpoint. So one last rapid fire question, sir. WhatsApp or Telegram or Signal? It's a very good question. It's 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 genuinely very good question. But um, as I said to you in the previous question as well, the answer to every question is it depends. So in India, especially in countries like India, where people have made WhatsApp as their habit. Now, whenever we, whenever it's, it's become a mindset and a habit, whenever we say earlier, if we think about 2005, we used to say, I will message you, I will email you, I will text you. But now we say, I'll WhatsApp you. So it has made a such a strong brand in a country like India that going off WhatsApp is impossible for a lot of people because for university students, there are WhatsApp groups. For work, uh, small businesses, there are there are WhatsApp groups, and so on. So yeah, I think uh, in privacy standpoint, like in terms of privacy and all those things, uh, Telegram or Signal might be a better choice. But again, there is no single answer to any question in this world. All of that depends on your situation. So I heard a very good meme about this that. Um, in in tele in uh, signal there is a lot of privacy but no user but in whatsapp there's no privacy but a lot of users so what one, which one will you choose so it depends on your uh, situation let's say if your friends are more on signal then you probably might choose signal but if you uh, are more if your community is more on whatsapp you can't go away from whatsapp so my views are that in a country like india signal to establish its brand is going to take a lot of time and it's going to take a lot of investment as well. They they won't they can't immediately replace WhatsApp anyways. Like it's 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 impossible. But if they work on it, they can. So it's it's depending on how much can they uh, can they as a company or a nonprofit actually be able to invest into creating a brand for themselves, promote their product, and so on. Exactly. Exactly. With this, we come to the end of our rapid fire session. We thoroughly enjoyed the rapid fire round, especially, sir. Uh, now, wrapping up, I would like to mention that it was indeed a great session, Madhupal. On the behalf of our entire team, I would like to express our sincere gratitude towards Madhupal for allotting this precious time for this insightful webinar. Thanking you once again for your presence, sir. We would also like to thank all our enthusiastic participants for showing up and making the webinar a success. This wouldn't have been possible without the continuous efforts of our volunteers and our entire team at IEEE ADIT Student Branch. With this, we come to the end of today's webinar. Thank you so much, everyone.
Thanks a lot, everyone.